Okay, we are at the top of the hour. We're going to go ahead and get started. We're here for non-fatal strangulation case review, a clinical practice discussion. We do have just a few housekeeping things that, and as a disclaimer, the views and opinions expressed by this presentation are those of the authors. They do not necessarily reflect any institution or organization, plus otherwise stated, and all pictures or photographs are used with permission. And just as a reminder, this is a case review, and so there may be some graphic um, photos that you'll be visualizing. And you do have some professional responsibilities. Our authors are bringing evidence of these topics, um, but we do know that new evidence emerges daily and it is your responsibility to seek out, understand and implement best evidence for your practice. Hi everybody. On behalf of the Executive Board of the Academy of Forensic Nursing, we welcome you to today's webinar, Non-Fatal Strangulation, a Case Review in a Clinical Practice Discussion. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing my colleagues to you today uh, that I work with here in Maryland for many years. We're very proud of them. Roz Berkowitz is a forensic nurse examiner at the Greater Baltimore Medical Center in Baltimore County. She graduated from University of Maryland School of Nursing. She's worked in many different areas of forensic nursing and in interpersonal violence and is on the steering committee of the Maryland Healthcare Coalition Against Domestic Violence, has done work with uh, national and uh, state legislation. And we're real proud to welcome her as a presenter today. Our next presenter, next slide please, is Pam Holtzinger. Dr. Holtzinger is an RN who works with the Frederick County program here in Maryland. And she does a full interpersonal violence program as well here in our state. She has served as a consultant to the Maryland Board of Nursing and has worked on many practice standards here in our state and done a large number of national and international presentations as well. Next slide please. And Kyle Kane uh, is here with us presenting for Tammy, I believe it's Leach, uh, JD in Frederick County. He graduated from Notre Dame School of Law in 2014. He's worked for the Frederick County State's Attorney's Office in Frederick, Maryland for six years in the Juvenile District and Circuit Court Divisions and currently handling narcotics and gang investigations there. So we welcome Mr. Kane as well as a presenter. So I will turn it over to our first presenter who I think is Roz Berkowitz. Actually, we have some, just a few polling questions. So we'll do those really quick. Um, okay, it should be open now. We'd like to know if you have had any formal training on non-fatal strangulation assessment. Uh, does your program use a standardized protocol which outlines the assessment after non-fatal strangulation? And have you ever testified as an expert in a non-fatal strangulation case? And Pam and Roz will keep this open until we hit about 85%. Um, uh, and then I'll share the results so you can discuss that with the group. Great, thank you. And there are your results. I'm not so sure. the polling doesn't actually get saved in the recording. So if you could discuss that with the group, that would be great. Sure. Um, I, I'm not sure if everybody can see all of it or if they have to scroll that if you're seeing what I'm scrolling. So from the from the first question about the formalized training on non-fatal strangulation, it looks like we have a nice cross section of different levels of um, training that people have had. And that's kind of what I thought we might see, um, but it's nice to see that it has a, a, a almost, it looks like about 30% on each and a, and a smaller number um, that have had none. Uh, the um, standardized protocol, which is really a question that um, Roz and I wanted to find out to see where people were with regard to um, a standardized approach. Um, be, in particular, because the case studies that we're talking about today were, um, we, we actually saw these patients in the infancy part of our development. Uh, so we'll have a little bit of conversation about that. 
Uh, so that's interesting that we have the, the vast majority of people on this um, have some sort of formalized um, assessment approach, which is fantastic. And then we wanted to find out uh, about the folks that have testified as an expert in these cases, because uh, this was something that Roz and I have talked about uh, several times. We have heard from several of our colleagues that, that have not uh, been asked to testify. And uh, we had asked our state's attorney, uh, our state's attorney's office, to uh, join us today just to have a conversation at the tail end of this presentation because of the, the, the case that I in particular will be presenting is a case that myself, I testified on, but there was the primary nurse that took care of this patient, um, which was an interesting uh, dynamic early on in our um, process of developing a protocol. So this is where, great, thank you. Can I just close it down then, Angelia? Thank you. Okay, okay so um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Pam Holtzinger. Um, I'm gonna just review a little bit of information introductory before Roz goes over her case, and we'll talk about the particulars of these two cases. Uh, we wanna talk, of course, about a standardized approach uh, on non-fatal non strangulation, which uh, was key to um, a lot of the success of our patients and our patient outcome. Uh, we do wanna talk a little bit about some of the priorities uh, and circumstances that have to be considered when you're implementing um, a protocol and what you have to do like in nursing any other time, which is really decide um, at the time what is in the best interest of the patient and um, in, but ensuring the integrity of what it is that we're trying to accomplish in evaluating our patients. And then giving you the perspective, the unique perspective, which we're very fortunate to have um, Kyle Kane with us with the state's attorney's office to give um, his perspective and Tammy's perspective um, on how this worked in this particular case, um, but also just giving uh, um, the value from their perspective as, as far as forensic nursing testifying in these cases, because some of the conversation that Roz and I've had is that that's not necessarily always welcomed in different areas, in different jurisdictions. So uh, what we will say is that this, um, this standardizing our approach has been a work in progress. And over the last several years, we've seen this um, in the documents and uh, publications that have been out there and a lot of the trainings that have been uh, more readily available. And like I said, these, these particular cases that we are presenting both were at a time uh, right after uh, Maryland um, adopted or has had language in the law that mandated uh, law enforcement get mandatory training on strangulation. And these cases happened right on the heels of when it was supposed to start in the state of Maryland. We did not at the time have um, on the books felony um, law related to strangulation. That just happened, but we were working towards that goal. So I would just preface this by saying that. Um, we do refer to um, the fact that in 2016, it was published the Non-Fatal Strangulation Toolkit documentation toolkit. And as we're talking about these, these cases, what I would like you to reflect on are um, these particular aspects, which really were um, excerpts from the example policy and procedure that came directly out of the non-fatal strangulation documentation toolkit. And those were the head to toe assessment, the, the lethality screening or danger assessment, um, the documentation, written body map and photography, uh, measurement of the head circumference, the use of ALS uh, for body fluids enhancement of visual uh, bruises or findings, the um, evidence collection, and then of course all your discharge safety planning resources and follow-up care. Okay. Roz? Good afternoon, everyone. For the purpose of this presentation, I'm gonna call my patient Mary, although that's not her real name. Mary was assaulted by her boyfriend and his sister two days prior to coming in for the exam. She was beaten, strangled, hit on the head, 
with what she thought was a chair, but she really was not sure because she didn't remember. She was kicked and stomped on. And then they took a taser out of her purse and used it on her back at least six times. She was taken by ambulance to a hospital on the other side of town where she was admitted for 48 hours. During that time, her father came in from where he lived, which is about two and a half hours away, to provide support for Mary. He took Mary to the police station as soon as they were discharged, and they sent her to us for a medical forensic strangulation exam. Mary told me that her boyfriend walked into their apartment two days ago and started yelling at her. He accused her of taking his drugs. She insisted that she didn't take them, but he called his sister who lived in the apartment behind theirs with her mother and told her to come help him beat Mary up. When I asked Mary about the method of strangulation, she told me that he used two hands from the front with his thumbs in the center of her neck. We always ask about pain. She said her pain at that time was a seven out of 10 and the pressure that she felt while she was being strangled was a nine out of 10. She said her vision went black, she could barely talk and she couldn't breathe. She again told me that his sister started kicking and stomping on her and that her boyfriend grabbed a taser that was in actually in Mary's pocketbook and handed it to his, her sister saying, get her with this. During that time, a neighbor heard the commotion and called the police and there was a knock on the door. Mary didn't realize it was the police. So at that time, their attention was taken away from her and she managed to jump out of the window. She has injuries that you'll see on the left side of her face from scraping it on the brick on the way down. Next slide, please. We did a initial assessment. We did a head to toe assessment. And as part of this, her vital signs were stable. She was alert and oriented times four. Glasgow coma scale was 15 and the cranial nerves were intact. Next slide, please. Evaluation and treatment, most of everything was done where she was previously admitted, but we were able to get the reports. The CTA of her neck was normal. The CT of her facial bones showed a non-displaced nasal bone fracture and she had a laceration to her head, which they stapled at the other hospital. So you're normally, we would do all of those here. This is what she looked like when she first came in. The injuries and this large scab on the lower part of her um, chin on the left side is from scraping it on the wall um, on the way down. And next slide, please. You could see all of the bruising around both eyes. He punched her in both eyes. Next slide, please. Um, you can see the injury on her chin a little closer. Um, she also scraped the left side of her face on the way down. You'll see some small linear abrasions probably on the next slide. So here are those abrasions from as she was going out the window, she scraped it, she said. You can also see in a distance the bruising on the left side of her neck from the strangulation. You can see a little bit of injury under her chin on, go ahead, Pam, next slide is good. You can see a little bit of bruising and abrasion under her chin as well, which was from the strangulation, she said. And here's a close up of the um, bruising on the left side from the strangulation from his right hand. Next slide, please. Here's some more bruising across the front of her neck. The picture on the left is in visible light. And the picture on the right is using the alternate light source. We use the an alternate light source for visible injuries to enhance the injuries to get a more accurate measurement of the 
extent of the injuries. And next slide, please. These are the injuries from strangulation on the right side of her neck and up under her jaw. You can see on the left side is the picture in visible light. And on the right side, again, is a photo using the alternate light source. And next slide. This is a picture of one of the injuries from what we thought was a taser, but it was not consistent with a ta what a taser injury would look like. And when I spoke to the domestic violence police officer that was handling the case, what they found was that it was a stun gun, which this is more consistent with. This is the only photo that I could really show because it covers most of her tattoo, which is an unusual tattoo and could be identifying. Usually with stun guns, you have the two circular um, areas with a thin line going across from the electricity. And this one must have been slightly tangential because the top part of it is not completely round. So the stun gun must have been held slightly on an angle, not flat against the back. And next photo, please. This is where his sister stomped all over her legs. Pretty dramatic. Um, next, in, next photo, please. And this is again, the staples from the injury to her head. And next photo, please. So signs and symptoms, it's very important to ask about all of these signs and symptoms because as we all know, often um, in less than 50% of cases may not have good visible injuries. So often cases are won based on signs and symptoms. My case had good visible injuries. The next case you'll see is a little bit different. So she denied neck pain at this time. Of course, it was two days post assault. She still had a headache, which she rated at eight out of 10. The vision changes that we already discussed where she saw black before that loss of consciousness. She had no petechial or subconjunctival hemorrhage. However, I could not get very good photos. And this is part of where how the patient's feeling takes priority over our protocol. I got maybe one or two photos, but when I went to open her eyes gently, she was in so much pain, she said up until this morning, she couldn't even open them. So she tried to open them for me. I got a closer look, but I really could get only a couple photos. I did not see any petechiae or hemorrhage. When we looked in her ears, she had no pain, no bleeding, and I didn't see any petechiae in her ears. Her nose, there were no petechiae, and there was no blood currently, but it was still slightly swollen and it was very painful, she said. She denied any difficulty swallowing or any pain with swallowing, but she currently has a sore throat, which is about six out of 10. And this is still, you know, a couple days after the assault. There was no drooling, no tongue injury, no lip injury, and she denied weakness to her arms and legs. Next slide, please. She denied voice changes and she didn't sound hoarse or raspy to me, which is commonly what we hear. She wasn't sure if she was dizzy, but she said she was lightheaded while being strangled right before she passed out. She also has a period of time that she was unable to account for, a period of amnesia while she was unconscious. She had difficulty breathing and was unable to breathe during the assault, but was fine now. And she denied a cough, nausea, or vomiting. And she also denied incontinence of urine and stool. Next slide, please. As far as advocacy, go, advocacy goes, we she signed consent 
so that we could share the medical and forensic records related to her current visit with Baltimore County police and detectives. She is going to stay with her father in another state and they went with the domestic violence police officer to the apartment just in case, even though the sister and the boyfriend were still in jail, um, mom lived right behind them and with her two kids in jail, we weren't sure what mom was gonna do. So we made arrangements for the police to go with her, which is what we do for most serious cases and most cases that screen in high, high danger. We did a danger assessment. Our advocates did a danger assessment that day, although she still had a lethality assessment done by the police on the scene when they first responded. We gave her the hotline number in the state where she moved with her father. And we were very fortunate that one of our nurses knew the nurse that runs the safe DV program and advocacy groups in the state where she was going. We got her permission to contact them and set her up to meet with them. And they have support groups and everything in case she felt the need for that. She did come back in to testify, however. Now, our state's attorney's office does not use our forensic nurses to testify as experts. However, I testify regularly in an adjacent county as an expert for strangulation. With the change in the law that Pam and I actually went and testified for, um, they are going to start using us for cases. So here's the outcome of this case. The first degree assault, the false imprisonment, and the dangerous weapon were all no prost for her boyfriend. He was found guilty of a second degree assault. He got 10 years and they suspended all but five. And next slide, please. For his sister, they also no prost the first degree assault, the false imprisonment and the dangerous weapon use. She pled guilty to a second degree assault and she was also sentenced to 10 years suspend all but five. We are hoping with the change in the law that once the courts open up for um, jury trials, we will be getting better outcomes for these cases. And next slide. I'm gonna turn this over to Pam. Um. Roz, we have a couple questions for you. Sure. First of all, first one is from Elizabeth Goodman. She wants to know, do you use, do you also use ALS for possible injuries that aren't visible to the naked eye? And if you do, in a case where there is illumination without visibility by the naked eye, do you identify these wounds as injuries, possible injuries, or illumination by ALS? We identify them if we use them as illumination by AMS, ALS because our program has the consensus of they're not convinced that everything that you see under the ALS is an injury because we do know that um, hyperpigmentation areas and scars and things like that show up as well. So we use it as an enhancement tool not as a diagnostic tool. Okay. The second question by Leslie Hansen is, um, she noticed you use Cortex Flow and she says, what ALS are you using that works with, with Cortex Flow because theirs turn out blurry? With Cortex Flow, the photos turn out blurry. So we use Cortex Flow mainly for our sexual assault exams. We have been using the Crime Cam for our strangulation exams. And it gives you two options. It gives you UV light and blue light. And for our strangulation exams, it's mostly UV light with the yellow filters and yellow goggles. And that's what we use. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. And if I could comment to that too, uh, much like what Roz was saying with regard to um, ALS, and we have been using it since the beginning of time, just like everybody else. Um, and I have had cases in particular 
where um, the, the patient's um, react, skin reaction just to the sun and um, skin damage from sun, which is very obvious in, in white light under ALS looks like injury. So you really need to be careful in your evaluation. Um, for us, we use the ALS for injury um, only to help with defining borders and making it a little bit more um, descript when we are um, describing what it is that we're seeing. But we will always use the, um, the initial uh, photograph that's taking in, taken in white light against that one with the ALS. Um, the other thing is we do also work with Cortex Flow and I have used the, um, the ALS and Cortex Flow without any um, blurriness. So I'm not quite sure. You might wanna contact them um, to see if there's some setting or something that might need to be adjusted, but we've, been, we've had success with that um, going forward. Now, I don't know if, if Roz, were you using ALS then when you did this case? I mean, yes. were you using Cortex Flow when you did this case? Um, actually, when we did this case, we did not have the Cortex Flow yet. Yeah. So I, we didn't have the option. Okay. Yeah, I thought- We have that another we, question. Have you guys qualified under Dober? Have you guys qualified under Dober as expert in court in your areas? I know we use that a lot in the city, but have you done it in your counties? Um, I can, I can answer this one. Um, Go ahead. Until just a couple months ago, Maryland used a different standard. So we're all in Maryland. We were under Fry Reed, which is a little bit different than Daubert. It's basically just new and novel. Um, we switched to Daubert maybe three or four months ago, and we haven't had any jury trials since then. So I don't know the answer. I don't imagine it's going to be an issue because we've been doing it for years and it met Fry Reed, which is similar um, to Dalbert, but I, I don't foresee that issue for us. I'm so glad you were able to answer that question, Kyle. Thank you, because I didn't realize that, that the standard had switched. That's good information. And one more question and then we'll We'll get you started, Pam. No when a follow-up exam, when a follow-up exam for non-fatal strangulation occurs, do the follow-up examiners use the same non-fatal strangulation assessment for signs and symptoms? I'm not quite sure what that means. I'm going to let Pam answer that because she does more follow-ups than we do. So one of the things I was going to speak to is the fact that because, the, again, both of these cases were done at a, at a time in infancy when it was being developed, we were, we were trying to get there, but we, we, don't, we didn't have then what we have now, which is a little bit more of a robust response to these cases. And um, as Roz was saying, not everybody does or has the ability to follow up on these cases. We are incredibly well resourced when it comes to being able to do that in our county. And as a result, we have had a, like, I think the last one was 74% return rate on our follow-ups. So we're really, I think is doing something novel. Um, but what we have been doing is we have um, a follow-up form specifically that, that extracts all of the symptomology checklist and, and some of the things that we want to follow up on our patient as far as assessment of um, the physical as well as the symptoms. But we also do follow-ups with that, that include our sexual assault. So we want to make sure that they're tolerating their medications well and that they're, that they're connecting with their um, community providers and resources that we have them linked to. So we have a, developed a form that is a, um, a miniature, if you will, of the, um, the, the, the form that we use for specifically our, our non-fatal strangulation patients. Does that answer the question? Was there anything else, Debbie? No, ma'am, you're good to go. Okay, fantastic. Those are good questions. Um, so uh, my case study is a little bit different um, and it was around the same time. Again, 
like I was saying, that um, as Roz and I are on uh, opposite sides of the state in Maryland, we, we do collaborate a lot uh, to share ideas and figure out how we can all improve and be better um, for the outcomes of our patients, which is our primary goal. But our, my case study, again, was in the same time frame as we were developing this and uh, the, the law in Maryland had passed to train of uh, the law enforcement agencies in the state. It was a mandatory training for all of them to get uh, non-fatal strangulation. And, but it didn't take place until the January of the year that this, start, that this case actually came out. So some, pay, some of our law enforcement agencies got it, some didn't, um, but we were working on our protocol. Um, this one was a 21 year old woman who presented to our emergency department, primarily with the complaint of a sexual assault. She said that she had been assaulted, uh, vaginally raped uh, three hours approximately prior to her uh, presenting to the emergency department. The, the location was right near where we are seated in our city. Uh, we do have a, a significant population of homeless individuals in our county that are located more so downtown. We do have what we call these tent communities um, that um, our uh, resources downtown, our, our community action agency, they're well aware of them and keep tabs on them. But this one in particular uh, was a little bit off from the general tent community. Uh, this, this particular location um, is unusual because they usually congregate together and, and pull their resources, but this one was just a little bit further outside of the norm. Um, and what had happened was that this woman was in her, um, in her tent and her boyfriend had left to go to work about six o'clock in the morning, which is again, not unusual. Um, our tent communities are right near um, access for these folks to reach or be able to walk or get transit to be able to go to work um, when they do and when they can uh, secure work. Uh, so he had left and gone to work. She fell asleep. When she woke up, it was sometime between um, six o'clock and eight o'clock is the best that we could um, figure. So it was almost you know, soon after he had left and this was a male friend that was known to both her and her boyfriend who had come into the uh, tent and um, had a, conversa a short conversation with her. And then according to her, and I pulled these quotes from her, uh, her uh, history to the forensic nurse um, who did the actual exam that evening or morning. She said that um, he started um, choking her initially with his right arm. Um, from behind. Uh, eventually, he did um, get to the point where he was, he was strangling her from the front as well. She said, I thought I was going to die. She told that to the triage nurse as well. Um, she says, I was raped. I thought I, he was going to kill me. She said that multiple times. She said she couldn't breathe. Um, he wouldn't stop and that she couldn't speak. Uh, the, what was interesting was as she was telling the story, she said to us that she couldn't feel her body. She also said at a later time that at one point she felt like she was out of her body. And those were pretty interesting um, statements to hear. And then during the conversation with, with the nurse, she said, I am embarrassed. I wet myself and maybe pooped is what she said. Um, the, the other thing that she had disclosed to the, um, to the nurse was that, that he had asked me if I wanted to live or die. And she said, I told him I wanted to live. And then um, in her words, he raped me is what she said. Uh, the patient described uh, being vaginally penetrated um, and then ejaculating onto her abdomen. So it was really important for obviously for the nurse to be able to know that. But what she told the nurse at that point was that, and this was after the strangulation event, um, she said that, uh, that he told her that she stunk and that he threw wipes at her and told her to get cleaned up. Um, that was important for us as we were um, putting the story together and she is telling us that she had lost control of both her bladder and her bowels, which was very evident 
um, when the patient did arrive to the hospital. She did not have underwear, but she had pantyhose on um, that did have stool in them, which we did take for um, evidence. She did describe at this point that uh, she said she just wanted to try to get away. And that, uh, so she left with this friend, this male friend to walk downtown Frederick, which is quite a bit of, of a ways to walk, but it's not unusual for our homeless population to do that. Um, and it was in the winter. So they were walking uh, downtown Frederick to a, a Starbucks that we have uh, downtown. And for her, she said that they were looking to try to find a place to be able to get warm. Uh, she did walk with him, um, said that I played along to try to get away. She was trying to find a way to get away from him um, and get uh, to the point where she could contact her sister-in-law by phone. She actually did it by text uh, and said uh, that she, what had happened to her, her sister-in-law was alarmed and, and then the patient ended up presenting to the hospital shortly thereafter and, and hitting into our triage bay at 9.13 in the morning with law enforcement. This is a picture, um, just one picture, just, just to give you a kind of an idea, but this is a picture of the, the tent where she was located. And I just wanna give you a couple of other interesting little factors about this case. Again, this was early in our development with our protocol and even our documentation. So um, upon review of the case, there were a lot of pieces of the documentation that we would have liked to have seen in there a little bit better than uh, we, than even now, we would definitely like to have it a little bit more robust in our questions and answers. But nonetheless, the nurse responded basically to the sexual assault on this patient, but realized because she was an experienced forensic nurse and had taken at least one day's worth of formalized training, she realized that we were dealing with um, the non-fatal strangulation aspect, which was critical as well. Um, the other piece to this was that the detective that responded to this case, Detective Ames, was also the detective that joined me in the um, the non-fatal, the advanced strangulation training out of San Diego the year before. Uh, so he was part of this multidisciplinary team that was looking at how do we integrate a protocol to be able to capture what we had been missing for many years. We really weren't necessarily capturing non-fatal strangulation as an important aspect of the evaluation. So we were very fortunate that Detective Ames was involved from the get-go and realized that also this was a critical piece to the, the full evaluation of this patient. So it improved our collaboration early on in this case. So abbreviated for our presentation today, I wanted to give you um, the, the initial assessment, which I think is important for many different reasons. The, the, much like Roz's patient, our patient was normal vital signs with the exception of being a little bit tachycardic, which would be definitely something that we would expect with someone who had just experienced this level of assault. Um, otherwise, it was normal. The, 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 her cranial nerves, G, GCS was 15. She was alert and oriented. In the triage note, they did note that she had some mild distress. That's all that was noted. They did not say anything further. The only reported symptoms from the patient was that she had a headache and a sore throat. Um, and so the nurse did conduct the full head to toe evaluation on the patient. And I wanted to give you, um, and hopefully you can appreciate the, um, the photographs as I'm going to show you. What I will preface this first by saying is that while Roz's presentation on her patient was very striking, I mean, it was very, it, you could see right away the level of injury um, based upon um, what you could see as far as her face and her neck um, and her back. This patient that presented did not necessarily have that impressive um, first look. So I, this often happens or has happened 
um, in emergency nursing, um, you know, for history, you take a look at the patient and it was winter. So she was like all bound up. We wouldn't have necessarily appreciated um, this patient's injuries had we not done a more full thorough assessment. Um, but obviously I think, and I use the red arrows to help highlight and point your eye towards some of these injuries. She did have, and they did note that she had a red neck uh, so she's got this, you know, this marking on the on the anterior portion of her neck, which is very consistent, obviously, with what she was saying, excuse me, there are some um, minor, you can see some petechiae in there, but if you don't have a big enough screen, you might not be able to see that. Uh, she also, at that point, did the full neck views, I didn't show you all of them. Uh, what I'm showing or highlighting here on the posterior aspect of her neck was that she had these um, three linear scratches. That's all that we were able to pick up back there. On the anterior portion of her upper chest and neck, there were several um, injuries or um, lesions that we were able to see and document. She did have uh, some bruising uh, above her clavicle on her right side, which I'm trying to highlight here. The patient um, was having a lot of difficulty opening her mouth fully, but she, we were able to get some good, you know, good views in, in her mouth. But she did say once we started evaluating her, how her tongue hurt her. And this is just the view that uh, the nurse was able to get uh, demonstrating the area of injury to the under aspect of her tongue. Now for her, the front part of her chest or the upper part of her chest, she had several different lesions. She had petechiae on her left clavicle. You can see probably better in this picture, the linear aspect of the presentation across her neck. Uh, she also had um, what looks like a scratch or linear injury uh, right uh, on her chest. And then again, on the, on the right side of her um, upper chest below the clavicle, she also had another uh, bruise or injury contusion there. And this is just another view. Now to complicate this with this patient, she also had um, some other um, presentation with her skin. She had some areas of acne. So it was really uh, very important for the nurse to be able to discern between the two from injury versus um, a skin presentation. So um, early in our process, one of the challenges that we had with our um, department head or with the, some of the physicians that would evaluate the patient is the, the cervical and the cervical, um, this, the, I'm sorry, the CT angio and getting that for vascular evaluation. In this case, it did not happen with our patient. What the patient got was a CT with cervical spine. They were looking for swelling um, or bony injury at the time they did the evaluations. Just wanna make a note on that. This was before we actually got to the point of having and adopting the radiology, radiological recommendations. Because she was a sexual assault, we did the full panel, including all the STI screening labs. We did um, counsel her and give her the HIV NPEP therapy. So we did all those associated labs as well. And from an evidence collection standpoint, we did do the full sexual assault kit, um, but included in this, the neck swabs for touch DNA, which was something new for us, but we worked with our Maryland State Crime Lab to come up with a process or protocol on how to do that and include it in our kit. We did use ALS um, to identify possible body fluids for swabbing and to enhance our visual findings not to discover or um, be able to identify things we could not see. It was just to, to look at those borders. Now, going back to the protocol or the toolkit, remember we, neck measurement was one of the things that were suggested as an example. And as a point of discussion, we don't traditionally do neck measurements on our patients for a couple of reasons. At the time, we weren't doing follow-ups. So really, there, what's the value in doing it if we don't have a follow-up? And then the process for discussion is who does it? And if you have a different clinician, can you value it? Do we have a standard on how to do that? And then what research do we have that helps us with that? From our standpoint, we look at it from a symptomology evaluation 
and looking at things that would um, compromise the area uh, airway that we would be looking for as far as an assessment, um, looking at it differently than just the neck measurement. So I just want to make that comment because um, that's something that we just did not employ at the time. We did give the patient full treatment and advocacy services for safety planning. Unfortunately, even with all of our discharge planning, we did make sure that the patient went to a safe location, offered shelter options, got them involved early. Um, but we were not able in this instance to do that follow-up care because we, first of all, we did not have the process in place. The patient became, because she was transient, made it very difficult for us to connect with her and be able to bring her back in for, for that follow-up. However, we did get to the point of um, going to court. And I'm going to let um, Kyle discuss that piece. Yeah, so the, um, the slide says using the evidence to corroborate the victim's report of the assault, but what I want to um, highlight too is that it also um, helped corroborate the civilian um, observations. Her sister, who she called her a sister, she was actually her aunt, who picked her up and drove her to the hospital, talked constantly on the stand about the smell that was coming from her, um, about how raspy and coarse her voice wa was, and just her overall demeanor being so much different than it normally was and that it was clear to her that something had happened. And then of course the forensic evaluation confirms all of those things. So if you can go to the next slide. So this again is the campsite. Um, as Pam said earlier, um, he ejaculated on her stomach. He told her to use a wipe to clean herself off. Well, she was actually able to report to the detective where she threw that wipe and they were able to go out and collect it. Um, his DNA was on the wipe and from the swab that was taken from her abdomen and from um, her vagina, we found his DNA. So we were able to match him to her in the way that she said. So I want to point out two things here. The first is um, at the very beginning in the polling questions. 88% of you said that you have at least some training in um, non-fatal strangulations. The standard to be an expert in court is some training knowledge and experience that the lay person doesn't have that is helpful to the finder of fact in evaluating the evidence. And that's pretty much the standard in every state and federal court um, in the country. So 88% of you right off the bat meet that. And I would guess that the other 12% of you at least have some experience um, in observing, even if you haven't trained, been to a class before today on this. So you have some of that experience and you can help um, a victim in court. The other thing that um, bring up, uh, there are two ways to fight a rape in most cases. It didn't happen or it was consent. So we know it that something happened because we have the DNA, which came from the forensic evaluation, and then that it wasn't consent, we get to from the injuries. So next slide. Um, we, the, we put the forensic nurse on who did the actual evaluation, and then we had Pam come in later and kind of give an overall um, opinion on it because we, he was also charged with a first degree assault for the intent to cause serious bodily injury. Um, you can, I'm not going to read all of those things, but you can, you can see what they have. And what's nice is throughout the testimony, we're building these themes about she urinated herself. She lost control of her bowels. She saw dots. She um, has a hoarse voice. She can't talk. And then the nurses who evaluate her get to say what that means. And a, it's very compelling to a jury to hear from an expert what these signs and symptoms mean in terms of life or death, in terms of you know, the effect on the body. So my specialty is um, narcotics and gang testimony. We would never put up a felony drug case without putting a chemist on the stand, without putting um, an officer with lots of experience in drug dealing to explain the words that people use, to explain the paraphernalia that's found. In the same way in the strangulations, 
we need somebody with this training to explain what it means when somebody has petechiae, how that occurs in the body, what it means, what the lasting effects of this serious strangulation are. So we had the external injuries consistent with what happened. Um, and our Maryland State Crime Lab, I think it was on the, the past slide, um, we were able to eliminate the consent defense. And so they were left in the position of um, an absurd defense that she essentially, because he had condoms around his tent too, had planted the evidence on herself. And at, during closing arguments, when the defense attorney is saying that, you can see the jurors just drop their pencils. They're done listening, especially the, the female jurors. It was over. We, we were able to defeat every avenue to undermining our victims' credibility, our victims' account of what happened. And um, it's because things were, were collected. We knew where to go look for evidence at the crime scene based on the evaluation. And we could explain Stacy, or excuse me, the victim didn't know exactly what had happened to her because she was beginning to lose consciousness and everything. But the nurses could tell us what had happened to her and that this was a very serious incident. So we had a trial, everyone um, testified. Um, he was found guilty of um, the first degree rape. He was found guilty of first degree assault and he is serving a life suspend all but 40 year sentence at this time. Thank you very much. We've got a couple questions in chat and that was excellent. Um, one is, can you send a copy of forms like initial meeting and follow-up forms that you use in your strangulation cases? And maybe Angela has already talked about those possibly being as part of a, a reference that, that we have that when this is taped that we can refer to. And the other one is we do not do alcohol or drug screening unless the patient reports feeling they were drugged or lost track of time. Do you do these tests routinely on all your sexual assault patients or is this a case by case basis? So um, I'm assuming that's for me since it was a sexual assault. Um, we we had that as part of our panel. So it really it really is driven by our ability to be able to assess our patient and making sure that um, that we we have all the information that we need to take care of them and ensure that the medications we're giving them are going to be you know that there's not going to be an issue. So as as a general rule for our sexual assaults, I mean we do consider that on every single patient. Yes. And if we don't, just like any other case that we would do, I will have a, a reason. There is gonna be a, a compelling reason why I do or don't do something, particularly if it's part of my protocol. And as a general rule, we do, um, because I wanna know, you know, if the patient is acting in a certain way, can I explain it um, to be able to manage or, or care for them? Plus if there was loss of consciousness or, loss of memory in particular, loss of any type of gap, I want to know if that was probably, um, if that is a probable factor for influencing that. And Excellent. We, we do the same thing. We do them on all patients for what Pam said, as well as, you know, we're not going to give them the flagell if they have alcohol on board. We will give it to them to take home and tell them to take it 12 hours or 24 hours later. But the other thing is, if they meet the criteria, we will also do a drug facilitated sexual assault, which we send out. Our lab doesn't do it, they send it out. Okay. And the last, well, we've got another one. Uh, Jackie Rodriguez wants to know in regards to testimony, are you using anyone currently to peer review your testimonies? That's a good question. That's a good question. We haven't used anyone to peer review our testimonies other than we will sit and talk, discuss it with the state's attorney after um, to see, you know, if there were any areas for improvement. But also, we often have our other nurses um, come 
for their learning experience as well. So we will just discuss the case and the testimony amongst us as they prepare for future testimony for themselves. I, I'll I will agree with that. I think that we try, whenever there's any one of us testifying, one of the things that I've, I've been doing this long enough, nurses are like frightened to death of testifying, you know? And so seeing somebody testify gives you a certain level of, you know, expectation and helps you through that process. It's just unknown. It's, it's out of our wheelhouse, right? Normally we don't do that as nurses. So we always invite other, um, other members to come. And if there's an opportunity for me to see somebody else testify, I certainly try to do that. I agree. And I can speak for the Strangulation Institute Medical Subcommittee. Um, they are now pulling transcripts from strangulation cases all across the country. So they are going to be looked at and peer reviewed from a national standpoint. So everybody should be on guard for how you testify. So I think that's excellent. Um, and the last question is uh, to Pam, was this patient admitted for observation? No, unfortunately, this patient was not. Um, again, this was all part of a new process for us and even trying to get them evaluated um, according to the protocol that we wanted was sometimes a bit of a challenge. Um, but no, we, we have had a few patients admitted for observation um, based upon the, the presentation um, since then but that would certainly be something that we would need to look at. Again, we wanted to highlight this because it was new and there were some things that weren't quite what we wanted. And we wanted to share that because we felt that that was really the learning opportunity for all of us. Excellent, we appreciate it very much. That concludes all the questions for today. Angelia? Hi Deb, we have one more over here in chat. Uh, Dr. Smock wants to know if the medical director peer reviews their cases. Oh. Um, with us, he does not. Our program peer reviews cases with monthly staff meetings on a regular basis, both sexual assault and non-fatal strangulation. But our medical director has, he does not. And I will echo that we have um, challenges having um, anyone in the position that has the level of training that some of the nurses or our colleagues have. So we seek our um, peer review in other, um, in other avenues. They are more or less um, trying to oversee, uh, making sure that we're in alignment with the national recommendations, like for our standing orders and stuff like that. But for us, it's, a, it's, it's also a financial issue um, as paying a medical director to be the medical director.